Uh, wow, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, two things. I want to talk about uh, an optimistic story, a, a conversation I think is ending, and also a little more speculatively, uh, a more pessimistic one and a conversation I think we should start having. So I'll start with the optimistic thing first. Uh, last May, one of my former students, Engin Ayaz, went back to Turkey, uh, and he was going there to open a makerspace in Istanbul. And his Facebook feed was filled with the kind of things you would expect in someone's Facebook feed who's leaving one place and going to another place. Goodbye, everybody. Here I go. Now I'm in Istanbul. This is what it looks like. And then all of a sudden, his Facebook feed is filled with a different kind of photographs. He has found himself in Ghazi Park in the middle of an incipient protest, and he starts using his Facebook feed to take photographs of what he's seeing and documenting. Now, we know this story. We know the story of ordinary citizens taking tools that are generally used for distributing that class of portraiture called selfie with third margarita and actually pressing those same tools into political use. But even given that we've seen that story over and over again, what happened in Turkey was an unusually pure test case because the Erdogan government had, even before those protests started, achieved near total control over the traditional media environment all print, all broadcast outlets. Even CNN, nominally in the business of covering breaking news, decided on the day that the Turkish police started firing tear gas that what the Turkish pe people really needed to see was a documentary on the life cycle of penguins. Because, you know, be alert. <laughs> despite, despite this near total control of the media environment, News of and documentation of the Ghazi Park uprising spread. It spread locally, it spread nationally, it spread internationally. In fact, the protest would not have grown in the way it did if it was not able to spread. What Engin and his occupying colleagues in Ghazi Park were able to do was to coordinate, synchronize their ideas, coordinate their actions, document the results without having to ask anybody for help or permission. And in fact, that ability to document things as they were happening was part of what made that protest grow. And it grew from being a small, environmentally focused and urban planning focused protest to being the most significant challenge the Erdogan government had ever faced. Now, Two or three years ago, a conversation was going around suggesting perhaps social media would not, in fact, have any real political, political impact, largely because any medium that's used to distribute videos of corgis on treadmills couldn't possibly also be serious. But that's the same logic as suggesting that the Declaration of Independence can't be important because erotic novels are also published on paper. Right? There, has, there is not now and has never been any way to divide either media or people into two buckets, one serious and one silly, one entertainment and one political. Any medium that allows people to synchronize their ideas, coordinate their actions, document the results, has an inherently political dimension, even if it's mostly latent. And as we saw last night from, from, from Jahani's talk about the square, about the, uh, the, the documentary about the uprising in Tahrir Square in Egypt, what, what goes on in these 21st century protest movements is the application of anti-power, the ability of a group of people coordinating very rapidly to prevent business as usual. Right? Now, the anti-power conversation we're used to is the one between the incumbents and the insurgents, and we've seen this happen over and over again. Right? Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. Between when I was invited here and now, we've seen it in Ukraine. And we're now in a world where it is obvious that there is not an autocratic government in this world that regards the spread of social media in their own country as anything other than a mortal threat. That's the good news. Here, potentially, is the bad news, and it's about democracy. We're used to the story of insurgents versus incumbents. But democracies don't have insurgencies. Democracies are made of insurgency. Every democracy has, by definition, a group of people who are eager to and planning to take over. In fact, if that group doesn't exist, the democracy has stopped being a democracy and slid into one-party rule, which makes what's happening in Thailand so disturbing. So a few years ago, in Thailand, the Red Shirt Uprising, the, 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 the more rural, more northern, the, the party representing the more rural, more northern Thai population, took over downtown Bangkok. They didn't just print red shirts and occupy the streets, although they did that. They knew that the Thai government was going to shut down the communications grid, so they built their own alternate Wi-Fi network. They had badge printers inside the perimeter of the insurgency to give out identifiers. 
This was a really serious application of anti-power, and it worked. It brought the government down. The yellow shirts who were in power were then thrown out of power, and the red shirts are now in power. And then last year, the yellow shirts did it. They occupied downtown Bangkok. They turned out in the street in yellow T-shirts. They built their own Wi-Fi networks. They had the badge printers again. Thailand is the first place where we've seen symmetric use of anti-power. It's not insurgents versus incumbents. It's two insurgencies, each of whom dislikes the other, each of whom can't rule without the other, each of whom can bring the other down. So the great thing about having a short talk is you can raise questions without having to provide the answers, <laughs> which is good in this case because I don't know the answer. But what I do know is that for the first time. We're seeing what multipolar use of these same techniques is like. Different groups of people using these coordination tools, not just to lead to one change of power. The ideal situation in Thailand will be a, a sort of democratic modus vivendi between the red shirts and the yellow shirts. The nightmare scenario will be that each group can bring the other to a halt, and the country becomes ungovernable. So when I think about where are we now. The question I'm worrying about is: Are we entering a world where it's harder to be an autocracy, but it's also harder to be a democracy? We'll see. Thank you.